Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Crimes, Killers, Cults, and Beer. And Beer. 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 Just two crazy Florida men drinking beer and talking about true crime. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's Todd. <laughs> and that's Bill. <laughs> My and image is backwards to me, so I'm not even going to try to point. <laughs> I think it's that way. Nope. No. That it, way. Yeah. That's Bill. Yeah. We're looking at now now. Yes, this is now now. <laughs> Space balls before we even started. Yeah. So uh what are you drinking? Uh today I have Miller Light. I don't know why, but that's what I have. Okay. I, have I got some rum too. I might switch to rum and bring out old powder blue. We'll see. <laughs> I have Bud Light. Of course you do. <laughs> that's like that's your thing. Yeah. And by the way, last week's episode should have been two parts, definitely. I mean, yeah, you know, we were a little buzzed toward the end of that episode, but um but we you know, we we got through it. I mean, we didn't we didn't like lose control of of the situation or anything like that. But the main thing is it's just like my freaking mouth was sore and tired <laughs> and stuff like that from talking. And you can hear me, you can hear me at the end, you know, like, like the last 30, 40 minutes of it. I'm just like, yeah. And yeah, it's just, you, you could totally hear that my, my mouth is like wore out. I know. I was, I was kind of, I was getting tired too. It was just like, <laughs> cause how, how long did we do that? dude? It was like five hours. Yeah, like. the, well, the episode it's it's it is officially our longest episode at two hours and forty nine minutes long. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was just a lot there. Yeah, and, we and with really all did. the breaks and everything that we took, yeah, I mean, I just, we had to have been recording for like four hours. <laughs> yeah, but and that was we a didn't long e- time. <laughs> we didn't even really go off the you know go off topic and digress very much either. Like maybe no, twice. Really. We'll have to start doing more. <laughs> People expect that from us. <laughs> yeah, so it's like if we if if we're getting to a point to where we're like an hour and a half, hour and forty minutes into it and there's still like um you know, like half of the half of the pages of the notes to go, we're just gonna we're just gonna find a place to wrap up and then do a second part. Like moving forward, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you should just plan it that way. When you get like after like, if you're doing notes for a show and you get like after you know like you have like thirty, forty pages, you just like figure out a middle point and just stop it there because yeah. you know it's going to go long. <laughs> well, yeah, but like this one, this one's not as long. But I mean, th- this one's not going to be a a two part episode. But um, it's but shorter still, by one... eleven pages. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and he says it's not going to go that long. <laughs> Does he know who he's who, who he's talking about? <laughs> he's talking about us. We always go long. <laughs> oh, okay, so this episode we're going back to Portland. Yay, Portland! Second week in a row, I'm Portland, and um, we're covering. Keith Hunter Jesperson, a.k.a. the Happy Face Killer. The Happy Face Killer. Okay. Mm-hmm. He was, a, he was born in Canada, but, you know, he did his serial killing in the United States. He mm-hmm. murdered at least eight women in the U.S. during the early 90s, and he was known as the happy the happy face killer because he would draw smiley faces on his letters that he would send to the police and the media. Oh, he was being one of those guys. Yeah. Like like Wayne Adam Ford, um <clears throat> Keith Jesperson was a over the road truck driver, but unlike Ford, Jesperson was one for a very long time. Okay. So, Oh, yeah, we're covering a truck driver. This <laughs> <laughs> uh, is actually the first truck driving, you know, the one, go well, Wade Adam Ford, you know, it, 
yeah. toward the toward the end of his thing he was a um you know he was he was a trucker this guy was a trucker pretty much the entire time the entire time yeah so right on um so another one you know who liked to taunt the police and media uh, similar to btk um although most of his victims were sex workers and transients btks were just random people in their own houses uh, yeah. but he was also a, a strangler and which we got it is start as a kid by strangling animals so i mean not gonna they focus, always do I'm not gonna focus too much on that but uh he's he's also confessed to killing 160 people <laughs> 160 it, it, yeah, eight, eight eight have been confirmed, but and there are probably more, but not 160. Yeah, probably not. That's a lot yeah. of people. Yeah. And the police, to their credit, didn't pounce on that like they did with Henry Lee Lucas and be like, "All right, that's that's a that's a closed case. That's a closed case. That's a closed right. case. We are killing it right now." These police had some senses. <laughs> Dick Darwin here. <laughs> but um, sources on this um, are the documentary on Discovery Plus, Very Scary People, Season 5, Episodes 11 and 12, The Happy Face Killer, Criminal Minds Wiki, a little bit of regular wiki. And um, I also used the Happy Face Killer book by Jack Olson. Now, the book In was... In relation to Jimmy? No. <laughs> the um the book was 50 bucks to get it on Amazon but thankfully my library had it but unfortunately they couldn't get it to me until like I was already writing the episode so I basically just used the book for his backstory his origin story if you will <laughs> but and I'm glad I'm glad I got it didn't want to pay 50 bucks for a book yeah who wants to do that shit man <laughs> yeah that God. Michael Mo the Michael Malloy book that, you know, you know this, this is the second time that I've used a book, you know, the library to track down a book, you know, uh -huh. our very first episode, my library got me that book too. <laughs> right on. So, but unfortunately I couldn't, you know, I, I didn't have enough time to re like really go through it. So I just used the other sources for like post childhood for this chucklehead. Right on. And I didn't say Chucklehead at all on the fucking Brutus episode. Not once in that long ass episode did Chuckle did Chucklehead come out of my mouth. No, it didn't. <laughs> so, Jesperson on the surface was a nice guy. He was a devoted father and husband, which was a facade. But um. He he definitely was not like that, <laughs> but but because of that facade, he was not somebody that anybody would expect to be a murderer. Uh, but he was, and he would blame the monster that lived inside of him that caused him to murder eight women squarely on his father. All right. And of course he did. Oh <laughs> well, yeah. But did his father yeah. want a girl or something? No, <laughs> he's different. He's different. Um, he's different than BTK in the aspect that BTK at home, for the most part, was a decent family man. Right. You know, as far as everybody knew, every you know, people, some people liked him, <laughs> but this this guy, yeah, well. he 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 played it off like he was cool and everything, but he was really a piece of shit. Okay. At home, I mean, and his family would assess, you know, would confirm that. So, I know. Um, it's not like, oh, he's such a sweet little boy. No. Nah. No, nah, he's a piece of shit. Yeah, you're you're gonna not like this guy really early. I mean, you're, yeah, he had a bad childhood, but he turned to the dark side like really, um, <laughs> really early into it. Really easily. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't take much to push him over the edge. Didn't take much at all. Well, just the cookies, probably, right? <laughs> the dark side, they they do have cookies. Yes, come to the dark side, we have cookies. Oh, by the way, that Wade Adam Ford episode that I was talking about, I did that one with um, Matthew from Murder Coaster, the mighty Murder Coaster. Right on. That was, that was, a, that was a 
great episode. <laughs> cool. But um, he was born April 6, 1955 in Chilliwack, British Columbia. <sighs> Chilliwack. Nothing like running a batch in a walk-in cooler. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> that's the first. That's where my mind went when I saw yeah, Chilliwack. You know, <laughs> I'm sure it's where everybody's <laughs> mind goes when they first hear that name. <laughs> I never heard of that city before. Me neither. <laughs> but it's my. It's now my favorite city name in the in, in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> that's even better than Intercourse. Was that Pennsylvania? I think so. <laughs> There's a weed in Oregon. Oh, yeah, and we're going to go there, too. Yeah. Oh, we are? Cool. Yeah. Because this, this story, you know, for the second second week in a row, oh, I already said that, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. So he he was the middle of five kids, and he had two brothers and two sisters, and they all lived on a farm in Chilliwack. <laughs> Chilliwack. Chilliwack. Shout out to our listeners in Chilliwack. If there are any. I know there are. You, you can't live in a town called Chilliwack and not be a fan of this show. <laughs> and not be a fan of this show, right? <laughs> oh. Uh, um. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. <laughs> Starting early. <laughs> you can say that Keith was the black sheep of the family. He was introverted. He was always finding ways of to of getting in trouble. He also had a very short attention span. Squirrel! <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. He was also really tall, but he was also clumsy and a portly lad. A tall, portly lad. Uh. He had trouble paying attention in school, and he got bad grades, and all of, and this was called all of his siblings to make fun of him. One of his brothers came up with a nickname that stuck, and it was Igor. Igor. <laughs> All right. Another name that came... Yeah, the, another name that they had was Baby Huey. Baby Huey. <laughs> Chunk. Chunk his, like Baby his father. Ruth. <laughs> now, his father... We're going to call him Les. But his name was actually Leslie. His father. Okay. It's not the first time I've ever heard of that. I've just always thought it was odd. Kind of like a boy named Sue type of thing. Right. But he was an alcoholic and very abusive, and he lived by the spare the rod, spoiled the child mantra. And all of the kids were abused by Les, but Keith got the worst of it. So he would run and hide and disappear into whatever reality he daydreamed. And I know. This fantasy became real to him in some cases it, it, it was an escape yeah but i can relate that, to that oh well, yeah but he didn't become a serial killer that we know of nope only in video games <laughs> i can't tell you how many people i've murdered in video games <laughs> les was well known and he was loved in town and everything and that made it harder because nobody could see him you know being abusive and plus it was the late 50s early 60s you know so that makes a difference too yeah because it was okay to beat your kids back then <laughs> but, but um it was yeah, still different times yeah <laughs> keith good old days <laughs> keith would keith would waver he, so, sometimes he would say that les was a great dad other times he would say that it was horrible i'm gonna go with horrible Sounds like horrible to me, yeah. Yeah. And Keith was also distant from his uh, from his mom, Gladys. So. All right. In 1960, family got a chocolate lab that became Keith's best friend. And he wasn't, he wasn't always mean to animals, but that changed. And this next part was probably what contributed to triggering that. He had so found a bird. Him? <laughs> well, you said chocolate lab, and that's the first thing that got. I mean, I knew you were talking about the dog, but yeah, that brown in my head. <laughs> Labrador. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I said chocolate lab, and you know, because 
Yeah, it's that sweet. I mean, dogs. Lily Mongo is a chocolate factory, not a lab, but you know. Anyway. Oh, and I, and spoiler alert: Keith does not kill this dog. Okay. Just, put, just putting that out there. Um, but <sighs> he and the dog were out running through the woods and all that stuff and he found a bird that had a broken wing he brought it home and tried to help it and he rigged up a little splint for it yeah it wouldn't have Popsicle helped sticks. yeah pretty much <laughs> it wouldn't have helped but yeah he's trying though yeah. you know what i mean but um his older brother who was also a douchebag like their father found it and, and he killed it I mean, Keith was devastated and decided to take his revenge. Uh-oh. Now, his brother had a bunch of model airplanes, and Keith smashed all of them. All right. This, of it's... course, won Keith an ass-kicking by less. And, you know, but Keith tried to tell him, it's like, what happened? He's like, hey, you can't. I was trying to, th- he-, he killed this bird. <laughs> yeah. But Les didn't care. That's not. <laughs> But Keith's attitude toward animals changed, and Les began taking him hunting. It probably has something to do with it too. And, Good. Yeah, there there were a bunch of feral cats all over the farm, and little by little, their numbers began to diminish. Hmm. Um, this became a father and son project that he that got he and Les a little bit closer together, but that was as good as it was going to get. Um, other than that, Les was still very abusive. How bad is that when the, like, the best thing you have with your dad is killing cats? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't like killing cats. I'm the crazy cat lady. So. Yeah. Um, Keith found some local punks to hang with, and they all began hunting and torturing animals. That was kind of like their thing. Um, right. Keith would later say that he would, he wanted to torture people the way that he did with the animals. Uh oh. Yep. And he would make an attempt at ten years old. A boy named Martin. Wow. Uh, Martin was a local punk, and he he and Keith would hang together, and they would always get into trouble. And it was usually Martin who was the ringleader, but if they got caught, which they always did, Martin <laughs> would put the blame on Keith. <coughs> Not a very good gang if you get caught all the time. <laughs> right. One day, Keith had enough of this, and he cornered Martin in a garage and started beating the shit out of him relentlessly and screaming that he was going to kill him. Yeah. It, at 10. At 10 years old. Uh, and he probably would have killed him, too, if um, if Les hadn't come running in and pulled Keith off of Martin. Because he wasn't going to stop. Right. Mar- Martin was badly hurt, and he was taken to the hospital. Keith tried to tell Les about how Martin was always getting him into trouble, but Les didn't buy it, and off came the belt and enter another ass-kicking. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Keith wasn't even safe at school. His okay. friends who he ran with, were they went to another school. And his, his classmates were constantly constantly ridiculing him calling him Igor and his brothers instigated this and you know <laughs> baby Huey <laughs> right <laughs> Keith also had sexual dysfunction which was partially caused by an incident on the farm oh. um, <laughs> Keith and his friends were running around, and a hired hand on the farm called for the boy. Hey, hey boys, come into the farm. I want to show you something. Oh. Uh, <laughs> see they, where this they, is going, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He told the boys that he was going to teach them about sex, and he had them all get naked. He then started molesting one of the other boys, and Keith wanted no part of this, so he got dressed and hauled ass. But the But the hired hand did rape his friend violently. Uh, well, at least it didn't happen to Keith. <laughs> it used, Probably it, should have, but... <laughs> well, yeah, but... It, it, you know, but hindsight being 2020 and all. It usually doesn't go that way in these stories. Usually it's the, the subject that gets violently yeah. raped. He claims rape that happened later on. But we'll get to that, so put a knife in that. 
<laughs> oh, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Probably shouldn't do that if this is going on YouTube. They might get upset. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyway. I think it's cool. But yeah. No, all we're doing is saying put a, instead of saying put a pin in it, we're saying put yeah. a knife in it. It's a true and crime just, podcast. And I'm just. You're putting a knife in it. Yes. <laughs> don't go around with knives, kids. Don't. <laughs> right. So about a year after Keith's incident with Martin, Keith was swimming in a lake. Tried to drown a kid by forcing him underwater until he blacked out. Wow. A few days later at a public pool, he tried the same thing with the same boy. At a a public pool? At a public pool. (laughs) And a lifeguard broke that up. I'm I'm not sure what his beef was with this boy, but later on he even shot this kid. Apparently he didn't like him. (laughs) Yeah, well, later on he even shot this kid in the nuts with a BB gun. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it probably didn't. It's just probably stung a little bit, but ow. Well, it depends on where it hit. If it actually hits the yeah, but I mean, dude, I mean, was the kid naked when he shot him with the BB gun, or you know? I mean, I don't know. If he had clothes on, that's gonna stop it a little bit. I don't know. I, don't I, know. I think that if if he had actually pulled this kid's clothes off or whatever it it would have said yeah but still yeah i don't even know what to say he he turned quick roll over roll over the wrong way in bed and you could find yourself you know in the fetal position <laughs> <laughs> yeah good even point. as even as a kid even yeah. as a kid Remember one time I was, um, yeah, we lived in the neighborhood in Rockledge and everything. And uh, my favorite thing would be to pull my bike up to the top of a hill because we lived at the foot of a hill and ride it down. But um, I lost control over it. I lost control of the bike as I was coming down. I was like five years old. And um, I'm coming down, I lost control and everything slammed right into the back of my dad's car. You know, of course, I was obviously riding a boy's bike, so I went right down onto onto that bar in the center, and I was probably doing a good twenty miles an hour. Ouch! <laughs> yeah. Dude, you, I mean, I remember when I was a kid who had I had a bike like that that had the fucking the nut pads, like you know, you had to pad around the neck of the bike and a pad on the the bar. It doesn't that doesn't for, do anything for just such an occasion. It oh, I know do they, were anything, so, they were so tiny, but they look cool. Yeah. They and, you know, cool, you had that little bit of kind of like that false sense of security, like, eh, it ain't going to hurt. Yeah. That's padded. i am be fine. But um, my, my bike had training wheels on it, so it didn't go over. So it hit, and I went straight down. Ugh. Yeah. Um, and I can remember my, my brother, he was a teenager at the time. He comes running out of the freaking house. This is before cult. But, um, but he comes running out of the house. The reason I remember it so much uh, because my brother – told you know reminded refresh my memory when right. i was older <clears throat> and he's just like he's like yeah i come running out of the house and i, and I saw you you're, you're just sitting there your your face is you know your face is like beat red you got your hands on on your crotch and you're just screaming bloody murder <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it's like he's like oh come here come here bro and he picks me up and all that stuff <laughs> and he, and he, and he told me it's just like I had to keep looking away because I'm laughing. <laughs> right. Oh man! Thanks a lot, bro. Oh, yeah. no, uh, I get little, it though. I get it though. Big brother, little brother. Yep, that's bullshit. what big brothers are for. Yeah, I got. And he went. He went to the. He went into the army. Him like a badass and everything, and we'd always like wrestle and stuff like that. And he would, of course, get me. Remember one time I was like 22, I was over at his house, and he started, you know, starts starts in on me again. I got his ass. I Did fucking, you? yeah. He he got me down in a headlock on on the floor, like in a like a a wrestling type move, like a real wrestling type move. And I managed to grab him from behind. I just flipped his ass over, and he went. Boom! And he hit the he hit the floor, and I jumped back up on him, with, and I put my knee right on his shoulder. And I said, "I got you, bitch." 
That was the last time we ever wrestled. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when little brother kicks big brother's ass, it's it's over with. <laughs> yeah, that, that's how I broke my ankle. <laughs> that's a funny story, but anyway. <laughs> Hashtag, but I digress. Yes. It was kind of on topic, though. Kind of. But Les decided that it was try- time to move, and... Um, Keith was 12 at this point. They decided to move to Salo, Washington. For some reason, Keith didn't want to go. I don't understand why. It's just like, dude, your life sucks here. <laughs> you know, everybody yeah, right. thinks you're a fucking dweeb. But um, he didn't have any e- easier time in school there. His brother still made sure, of, you know, his brothers made sure that these kids even made fun of his accent, eh? <laughs> <laughs> He's only in sixth grade at this point. A. <laughs> a. Take off. British, British Columbia, that's that's over in the western part where A is like re- really prominent. I have no idea. I only know it from Bob and Doug McKenzie. Well, I, I, I know this because I'm, you know, the Canadian podcast that I am close with. The, the, the singular Canadian <laughs> podcast that I'm podcast from the hat (laughs) Les tried his head at several different businesses and he put Keith and his brothers to work on the farm and he taught Keith how to weld how to run the farm equipment and Keith tried to make Les proud but his brothers were still favored he paid the kids but he also made you know he also made them pay rent (laughs) well you know as you do but when he was 14, he found out that he was the only one of the kids that was being charged rent. <laughs> he was the only one. Was he like the middle child or something? I don't yeah, he, say that. Yeah, he, he, he was the third out of five. So there was straight two up middle, two out. Straight yeah. up middle kid. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> fucked. <laughs> uh. <laughs> At 14, he had a bro spurt. A, a brost. <laughs> a a, <growth> sp- <laughs> a growth spurt. Yeah, I know what you meant, but I was just trying to figure out how you got to what you said. <laughs> yeah, he, he was tall. You know, he was he was tall for his age already, but now he's even taller and everything. Uh, but that filled out the 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 portliness of his thing. It you know stretched oh, it all out, and made yeah. it more proportionate and everything. Wayne, Wayne Adam Ford was a boob man. J- Jerry Brudos was a boob man, kind of, when he wasn't licking shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, Keith... Had... <laughs> <laughs> oh, the images that just popped into my head. Oh, my God. You're oh. welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, th- I thought I'd gotten rid of that from last week, but apparently not. <laughs> but um, at this point... Keith was not a boob boy. A boob boy? A boob he boy. Wasn't, he, he wasn't a boob boy. All right. It was the summer of 69. Um, Keith and his family took a vacation. And there were lots of teens running around there. It was like a resort area. And, you know, it was back in Canada. And Keith hooked up with a girl that was there. And they made out. But when she took off her shirt, he got grossed out by the side of of her breasts and he hauled ass. All right. <laughs> Who the he hell does pre- that? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's still pre His mind is still prepubescent. Um, All right. He was behind other kids at his, at, at his age at, at sexual development. And later the day he hooked up with another girl. They too made out, but he made her keep her shirt on. <laughs> See, because pe- people before puberty, they don't look at things like like that, you know. So he's he's definitely developmentally challenged. Yeah, you know, it's just like normally at fourteen years old, boobs are the fucking holy grail. <laughs> yeah, no shit, right? <laughs> but but these girls, of course, told everybody. And and just to add this to all of the things that people ragged him about, even less thought that this was freaking hilarious. <laughs> Keith 
Keith ran off and hid and pretended he was Sigmund the Sea Monster. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or the pirate from Mandalorian. <laughs> well, this is this is the summer of sixty nine. I know. So. But that's what the pirate guy from Mandalorian looked like to me. That's the first yeah, thing I thought of when I, I saw I him. Yeah, I forgot about him. But that was that show even was that show even on in '69? <laughs> I think it was. Yeah, that all that um, HR puff and stuff. Yeah, that Sid and Marty Cross stuff was like all like late '60s, early '70s, I think. I don't know, but I watched them all when I was a kid, so you know. I'm. Um, I I remember seeing episodes before our TV was dragged to the street and destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When they when they got back home, Keith began reading books about anatomy and sex. And I'm sure that he got a hold of some Playboy magazines as well. Uh, and he he swore by the power of Hugh Hefner. <laughs> <laughs> My next uh, encounter would be a normal, and I like it. <laughs> Dude, can you imagine? <laughs> Guy was freaked out by boobs, seeing a totally naked girl, man. He'd lose his mind. <laughs> like Bruno's did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're grossed out by boobs, wait till you see the rest of it. Like Bruno's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? But anyway. he, he would get his chance sooner rather than later. A couple months later, Les took him on a fishing trip where one night he saw an 18-year-old girl sitting by herself, and he looked older than he actually was because of the bro. The gro- I just did it again. The growth spurt. The, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the growth spurt that he had hit. He approached her. They start making out, and they actually had sex right there on the beach. And <laughs> but he would later say that she had raped him. <laughs> but you you can't rape the willing. You can't rape the willing, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, here we go. And if and if you're willing, and it's something that you later regret, it's still later regret doesn't equal rape. You were willing at the time. Yes. <laughs> so, Dang two it. years later, Keith bought his first car. Um. He was still hunting, and he would shoot with the intent to injure so that he could hear the animals scream as they died. And he specifically liked rabbits. And if you've never heard a rabbit scream, I hope you keep it that way because that is the sound that will haunt you. Yes. Dude, I don't even kill rabbits in video games. I let the rabbits go. <laughs> I do, seriously. I don't kill rabbits. You can look, you can look on my... Um... My, 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 my Skyrim uh, stats page, it says rabbits butchered zero. What, do they make them scream in the game? I don't know. I've never tried to kill one. Because <laughs> they're bunny rabbits, man. They're like pets. Don't kill, don't kill pets. <sighs> well, I, I, used to bre- I used to breed pythons back in the 90s, so, yeah. Well, I've heard. That, that's, I've, that's a different story. <laughs> no, but I've, I've heard rabbits scream in... Yeah, it, yes. it. The fact that he got off by hearing that scream. I'm sorry yeah, that that that. I'm thinking about it right now, and I can still hear it as loud and as you know, like like it happened thirty seconds ago. Do you still hear them, Clarice? No, I don't hear the rabbits. <laughs> uh. Only when I think about it, which isn't very often anymore, because that was a long time ago, but. It's still, I. Dude, ugh. speaking of that, dude, I was I was in a pet store one time, and this dude walked by, and I, I had the kittens, and the, you know, and he was like, "Dude, I bet my snake would eat one of these," and I'm like, "You better not fucking feed that cat to a snake, motherfucker." <laughs> but I will find you. I will hunt you down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but Keith never heard. Keith, damn it! Here we go. Yep. Keith never harmed the chocolate lab that they had, but by now this dog was very old, but he was still a very good boy. Yep. I've, I, I've never seen a lab that wasn't a good boy or a good girl. 
Those dogs were bred to be good boys. Yeah. And good girls. <laughs> but um, that was the only animal that was safe from Keith. But one day he came home and the dog was nowhere to be found. Uh-oh. L- Les told him that he had shot the dog to put it out of his misery. And <laughs> But the dog could barely walk in anymore yeah. due to arthritis and everything. Oh, yeah. And Les said that the dog had gotten a hold of some, and eat, eaten some coyote poison. You know, I could believe that he put the dog out of his misery for, you know, like arthritis and all that stuff. Yeah. But, you know, the, I don't know. The coyote poison, unless it actually happened, that's like an unnecessary detail. I don't... But then yeah. again... Less like less less like that dog too. So, yeah, yeah. But it's I'll take his word for it. Yeah, I, same here. Although I I probably would have. Well, actually, if dog ate coyote poison, then the dog was probably like writhing around in pain and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, it was dying anyway. Sense. Yeah. So it makes just just end it. Yeah. So. But Keith didn't believe Les. He thought that Les had done it as just another way to torment him. And he took Jesus. it out on any other dog that he encountered, too. Just, I mean, he didn't, like, torture them, but he would just, like, flick their noses and pull their ears and stuff like that. Just be a general asshole. Just being a dickhead, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> but at that point, whatever shred of humanity that he had was gone. Um, he didn't care if people had lived or died. At this point, Keith had graduated high school. He had gotten a job at a gas station. He had gotten his own place. He had bought a motorcycle that was his prized possession. Right on. Les begged him. He was like, let me, let me ride it, eh? <laughs> I want to, I want to ride the motorbike, eh? <laughs> but, Tell um, Keith led him, and Les took off on it, and he was hammered. Uh-oh. And he crashed, and he wound up at the hospital. Uh, Les and Gladys both begged Keith to move back in and on, uh, into the farm and run it because Les couldn't at, the, at that point. Keith caved in, and he did, but what about the other four kids? Specifically, the the, the ones the other, he liked. <laughs> yeah, specifically the other two sons that he had. You know, uh, well, I mean, why, why is it got to be Keith? So they got but somebody still. to pick on. <laughs> oh yeah, well Keith's already an asshole at this point. So I mean, I, this isn't like some of these others, like Jerry Brudos, where you feel sorry for him as a kid. This guy was a. <laughs> he's pretty much been a dick since he was born. It sounds yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Les was eventually released from the hospital, but he wasn't able to work yet. But he actually made Keith sell the motorcycle because he couldn't stand to look at it after a horrific accident. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah. Like the Surprisingly, the bike wasn't really all that badly damaged. And Keith had, Keith had restored it, you know, put it... Yeah. You know, rest- Fixed it up, yeah. I got it. Yeah, so Keith relented and he sold it. His most oh. prized freaking possession just because, oh, I was a drunk idiot and I was driving down mountain roads and everything and I was fucking wiped out. And I want it was you the to bike's se- fault. Yeah. It was the bike's fault. I want you to sell the thing because, it's, uh, because yeah, I, I, I can't take the trauma. Oh, <laughs> <geez. laughs> A. <sighs> Jeez, God, go cry in your safe space, you mother. <laughs> Keith wanted out, and he would find a way soon enough. He was he, he was out at a barbecue restaurant one time, and he met 17-year-old Rose Pernick. You know, she worked there, and they chatted, and Keith asked her out. She declined, but Keith didn't back down. And after a couple more visits there, she finally agreed to go out with him. I've never had good luck trying to hook up with somebody <laughs> at their up job. A <laughs> yeah, that's never worked. No. Nah. This restaurant you worked at, there was this girl that I was like absolutely freaking uh, enamored with. Which one? 
Valerie. It's back in the 90s. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I know you're yeah, doing that. Yeah. I was like in love with that girl. I, I must have asked her out 10 different times, and every time she shot me down. <laughs> but I think she ended up marrying a cop. And of course she did. <laughs> yeah, I, a couple of waitresses over there ended up with cops. Because the cops would always hang out there. <laughs> yeah. The cops were always there on their days off getting hammered. Yeah, but I was in love with that girl. I, I told, I, yeah, that, I could see yeah, she girl, was cute. Yeah. Yeah. But Keith's parents, um, yeah, Keith's parents were happy for him, but, you know, once they became official, but Rose's parents, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But once he had her, he wasn't really sure about how he felt about her and everything. She was pretty and all, but her looks didn't excite him. But Les wanted grandkids, and Rose wanted out of her parents' house. So he's basically got both both sides coming at him. Put a ring on that girl's finger, and she's like, yeah. "Put a ring on my finger." <laughs> yeah. So, Fuck. so they were so they were married, and right out of the gate, it was not good. He didn't enjoy sex with her. He wanted to try things that she wanted no part of, like violence. So. Oh. Keith went back to abusing animals. Um, Les had brought a shitty trailer park, and Keith was working there, and he, of course, found ways to get rid of animals that made their way into the trailer park. (laughs) Yeah. That didn't last long, because Keith wanted real money, so he became a truck driver. (laughs) Should have gone to work for uh, animal control or something. He would have just been, he got got paid to do that. Truck drivers make more than animal control. <laughs> yeah, but he'd be doing something he loves. True. Oh, it's he not loved a job. Driving. It's not. A, it's not a job when you do what you love. Oh, he loved. He loved truck driving. He's not. He's not like me. I freaking hate it. But <laughs> the money's good, so there's that. The money's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, but truck driving probably isn't the best job for somebody that gets lost in fantasy daydreaming. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I was lost in a <laughs> dream. <laughs> he didn't want kids at first, but before too long, he had a daughter in 1979 and a son in 1980. Um, His pull-out named... game was kind of weak, huh? <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> sorry, I had to go there. Uh, his daughter was Melissa, his son was Jason, and he was worried that his offspring might carry his dark passenger. <laughs> that's hey but this this came out later but either you know whether whether that's what he was thinking at the time or not if that's what he was thinking at the time i mean that's a legitimate concern because then that also shows that he knows he's got something wrong with him yeah <clears throat> so the insanity so. plea is out the door <laughs> but he turned into a good dad and a good husband, and and he even warned Les that he better not lay a hand on on his kids. Well, when you have kids, that's your life. You do anything mm-hmm. for them. But before t- too long, his violent urges returned, and he killed a stray cat in front of Melissa. He even killed a litter of kittens that Melissa had found. That had been abandoned by their mother. It's it probably the it was probably the cat that, you know, the cat that Les killed was probably the mother of those. I'm just yeah. speculating, but um, Melissa would later say that he bragged about killing a, a woman to her. Plus, he was gone for so long while he was working, but when he got back for home time, all he wanted to do was have sex. And Rose usually shot him down, telling him to take care of it himself. <laughs> And her name was Rose. <laughs> what do you think I do with the truck, Rose? <laughs> I got Rosie and her five sisters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey. Hey. Oh, mm. Jesus. So, before I mean, too long, huh? Nothing. Go ahead. 
before too long, Keith moved his family back to Canada and he got a job in a coal mine. And he and his co-workers would party in their off time and he he was running with, with bikers. Um, Rose was home alone with the kids and everything and, and she was convinced that that Keith was cheating on her, but apparently he wasn't yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Keith was fired from his job, and right about the same time, Rose was pregnant with their third child, a girl named Carrie. She was born in 1983. Um, Keith began bouncing around from job to job. And to make matters worse, Gladys, his mom, was diagnosed with cancer, so they moved back to Washington, where his violent urges came back. Sexual right. urges. For several years, he moped around, but he became a truck driver again. But prior to that, he was trying to join the RCMP, but wound up getting hurt. So that's why he went back to trucking. The Mounties. <laughs> On the road, he started sleeping around with the women that he picked up from bars and truck stops and whatnot. He started an affair with a woman that he had met in Weed, California. Okay. Or is it Oregon? I don't know. There's probably a weed in every state, dude. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but um, she was a single mother, but she had a mean streak that was equal to Keith's, and it was like a, a match made somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was a match made in heaven, but it was definitely a match. It was, it was definitely made, a match made somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> She liked it rough, and Keith's just like, I don't want to lose this girl. Yeah, right? One night when Keith was home, he told Rose that he wanted a divorce, and she just ignored him the same way Jerry Brudos' wife did when he came out in the lingerie. <laughs> uh, damn it, man. By the way, if this is your first time hearing this podcast, the Brudos episode is the previous one <laughs> yeah, just go one. back one just go back one after you finish listening to this one <laughs> yes at the end of 1998 they were divorced and his new girlfriend she was abuse to her kids as well just like les was and obviously keith didn't really take kindly to that mm -hmm. um one night they were drinking and got into a fight keith took off for a few hours to calm down and when he came back the you know the woman was passed out on the bed like passed out hard because he raped her several times and she didn't wake up wow um oh my he after after leaving there he went somewhere take a guess i don't know back to rose you know, I, I wouldn't even thought of that one. <laughs> <laughs> the woman yeah. woke up the next day and didn't remember anything, but she was naked. So she Why knew am I something. naked? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She knew something was up. She asked Keith, she's like, did you rape me in my sleep? And he's like, yeah. Hey. <laughs> no, it was another guy wearing the same clothes and a mask. <laughs> Plausible. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, it could happen. <laughs> but he, he then started going back and, back and forth between Rose and this other woman. But then he lost his job and he crawled into a bottle. He was day drinking, afternoon drinking, night drinking, morning drinking. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's, he's telling me. I only Andy, drink on days that ended why. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was... He was he was telling anybody who would listen how much he hated Rose and and his side piece. Which was the side piece at this point? Well, he's married to Rose, so the other girl is still technically, I guess. But he even left though, her. Even though... Okay, then I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> so I was going to say he left her, and then now he's juggling both of them. So which one's the side piece? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. I can't figure that one out. That's too tough for my brain right now. <sighs> These people that do shit like that, it's just like, do you realize how much drama you are creating for yourself? 
You in know? that situation, yeah. So. But. Y'all using me for my money, eh? Eh. He don't care about me, eh? It was just about what they wanted. He hated. Yeah, I, I, I hate women. <laughs> eh? <laughs> and before too long, he would find a new love interest who would spark his, his desires and start a new hobby, which was what? Killing people? Yeah. <laughs> I got it right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> And he would soon, he would also realize that this would be much easier due to his chosen profession. Oh, well, yeah. <sighs> Truck driving. By now, you know, I, I forgot to mention this before, but now as a f- full grown adult and everything, he's six, seven, and stocky. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you should have gone and been a wrestler or something, man. Holy crap. Freaking defensive lineman or something. Yeah. Or a linebacker. No, a linebacker. Stocky because, yeah. you know, if he's, he's stocky and built and everything, that means, you know, he, he might be quicker. But. Maybe. Maybe. You did say he was clumsy when he was young. Did he ever get over that? <laughs> I'm guessing he did because when he when he hit that growth spurt, everything <laughs> filled out, you know. Yeah. See pictures of him; he's not a bad looking dude. I mean, he's he's not like you know he doesn't look like Dennis Rader or BTK. He doesn't you know he doesn't look like Jerry Brudos. This guy's actually you know he's not <laughs> he. You know, yeah. He's. But so Tanya Bennett was 23 years old. She lived in Portland, Oregon. Um, her and her mother and older sister had grown up very poor and they were very close and at, she was 23 and she was mentally disabled or mildly mentally disabled and she lived with her mother who was like her caretaker mm-hmm. and she was functional though I mean she had even graduated high school like regular high school not like special ed or anything like that um, <clears throat> her most Prized possession was a Sony Walkman. I had one. I had one of those. I never uh, actually had a walk a Sony, but uh, you know, I I had the probably the exact same the the blue and the blue and silver model and everything with the orange but, foam on the headphones. Yeah, yeah. I never had one of those. Probably were, the exact same model that I did. Although I got I got to listen to cult music in my Walkman. <laughs> Yay! But um. She took it everywhere, and she's always jamming. And everybody in the neighborhood knew her and liked her. I mean, she she was like super friendly. January twenty first, nineteen ninety. An actual date. <laughs> um, Keith was heading to the bar to do some day drinking, and he sat at the bar and in strolled Tanya. She had her purse. She had her Walkman. She was rocking the new Madonna album. I think it was probably the one that had Like a Prayer on it, which was actually probably Madonna's best album. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I... Or only good album. <laughs> I don't care. I don't, you know, I don't care much for Madonna now. I don't but... either, but the, 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 I haven't heard the entire album, but there was like four singles that came off of that album and they were all really good. She had, yeah, she has some good songs. Yeah. But... So she goes into the bar and she starts hugging everybody there. Like, everybody. Um, started playing pool with two guys and later they left. And, you know, Tanya left around the same time, but not with the two guys. And that was the last and the last time anybody had seen her alive. Wow. Her sister and mother searched but didn't come you know, but when she didn't come home, but the next day somebody reported that they had, had found a body off of a road. And it was a forest road that runs next to I eighty four, but it's through the actual mountains of the Columbia Gorge. I eighty four runs at the bottom. Yeah. 
of them. And it's, it's such a beautiful drive to go to, to drive. It's, that whole area is just gorgeous. It's like the most beautiful scenery I've ever seen in my life. But she was partially nude. She had been dropped off of a steep hill. Um, her face had been like literally obliterated. She had a rope around her neck and the zipper and the jeans that she was wearing had been cut out of the jeans. Uh, okay. They found a Swiss Army knife, Walkman headphones. They didn't find the Walkman. And they found a hair on her her body that didn't belong to her, which was also taken into evidence. You know, her purse and the Walkman were not found, but put a knife in that. Oh, shit. Hold on. I wasn't ready. <laughs> a sketch of the victim was released, and on January 31st, it was announced that a woman had been killed, and she was a Jane Doe. The sketch looked nothing like um, Tanya, but the clothes were recognized by Tanya's sister, who later identified Tanya. So they made a sketch because they couldn't tell what her face looked like. Yeah, because it so was they just kind of guess. Yeah. Hopefully but everybody, everybody that she knew was interviewed. And they wanted to find the two men that she was shooting pool with once it was established that, you know, she had been with them at the bar. They found them. Their alibis checked out. A woman called in anonymously. She was pointing the finger at her boyfriend. This is where it gets weird. She said that her boyfriend had been talking about a dead girl. And his name was John Sosnovsky. I think right. I got that. I think I got that right, actually. Sosnovsky. I think I got that right. All right. Um, she said that he had told her that he and another guy had strangled this girl to death. John was 39. His girlfriend was 57-year-old Laverne Pavlinak. Okay. <sighs> I'm not doing any, me any favors with these last names, people. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But she had called it a fake report after studying this case in the newspaper. And she saw the opportunity to get rid of John, who was abusive to her, allegedly. Mm -hmm. John had no criminal record other than one DUI. Um, he, he lived with Laverne, at, like in her place, and he was a very heavy drinker. And she was interviewed by police, and, but in, she said that he came in at 1 a.m. and took a shower and washed his clothes. Police searched the house and found um, nothing other than a piece of paper that had T. Bennett, good peace, written on it. Police then went to go interview John. And at this point, it's a month after Tanya's murder, and he, of course, denied everything. But they asked him about the paper. He's like, I don't remember writing about that. Remember, <laughs> this guy's like drunk all the time. Yeah. They then told him that it was Laverne that who'd, who had reported him. They let him go because they really didn't have anything to hold him on, but they did take a, uh, a hair sample from him to test against the one that they found on Tanya. Right on. When he was released, Laverne, you know, Laverne called. She's like, I've got more evidence. <laughs> a purse. This, this bit right here is what makes this story... Like it, it's in its it's in its own category as oh, yeah. far as like weird. Um, but the, the, but she conveniently found a purse, a piece of fabric, and the zipper from a pair of jeans. <laughs> well, damn, ain't that convenient? <laughs> this was tested against Tanya's jeans and. The hair was consistent with the hair that was found on Tanya. But the hair samples, I mean, you know, yeah. hair, hair samples are not like DNA. 
or even fingerprints for that matter. Unless you got the tag on the end. Unless you, yeah. get, the, unless you get the root, you ain't, you ain't getting nothing from it. Right. The purse was the same type that Tanya had, according to Tanya's sister. But neither the purse or the denim was a, a match. Yeah, it's just, it, yeah, the purse was the same, and the denim was just random denim. But the, the purse the purse was brand new. Tanya's purse wasn't brand new. <laughs> so I see what's uh, well, going on here. Yeah, so, uh, well, they hadn't found Tanya's purse yet. Yeah. But, uh, but still, her sister is just like, no, she had had that purse for like a year. So <laughs> this purse that she did was like brand new. Yeah, she's fabricating evidence. Yep. So um, all they had was the hair, and they asked Laverne, yeah, you know, she's like, "What? What's 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 up with this?" It's like the purse is brand new, the denim does not match the denim that um, was yeah. on her jeans. Um, she's like, "I planted those things," and she changed her story, saying that she knew it was John because she had seen him with the body. Right. He called her the Jubit's truck stop, which, um, and if he asked her to bring a shower curtain there. And when, when she got there, Tanya's body was on the ground. John said that he had killed her and that she was going to help him get rid of it. So they put the body in the trunk, wrapped it, you know, they wrapped the body up in the, um, the shower curtain, put it in the trunk, drove to Columbia River Gorge, dumped it. She asked him why he did it, and he said that because she had fought him. She's like, I'm going to report this, and he threatened to kill her and harm her family if she did. (laughs) (laughs) See, I don't even know what to say about that. That's, uh, (laughs) yeah. Fuck. (laughs) She drove them to the location and and said that that's where um, Tanya had been dumped. And she was right somehow. <laughs> she really studied this story. And, and, but because of that, police are starting to take her seriously. But it wasn't fast enough for her liking. So then she called again saying it was correction time. <laughs> uh, Call the editor. Call the editor. <laughs> Moving the goalposts. <laughs> yeah. It's a news story. He called her to Jew but some yeah, and when she arrived, Tanya was alive with John. They were arguing and they got into the car and drove into the gorge and he was saying that he was gonna have sex with Tanya. Okay. Um He got a rope out of the trunk and told her to put the rope around Tanya's neck. She did. And she even said that she believed that she had actually been the one that caused Tanya's death <laughs> by strangling her. Okay. D- dumbass. Um, um, she was then arrested and charged with murder. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, John was also arrested and charged and Laverde tried to change her story again, say, "Oh, I made the whole thing up." Well, well sorry. yeah, no shit. You're gonna go to jail for the rest <laughs> of your life. Oh, I was just joking. I'm sorry. Yeah, but the the police didn't buy it because she had implicated herself for murder. Yeah, dude, what the hell is wrong with this woman? <laughs> <laughs> I see this. You see this. <laughs> oh. But then again, we know it was a serial killer and not them. Well, so yeah. But as the case was coming together, there was a report from a rest stop in Montana that somebody had written on the bathroom wall, January 21st, 1990, killed Tanya Bennett in Portland, Oregon. I beat her to death, raped her, and I loved it. Yes, I'm sick, but I enjoy myself too. The one from Umatilla, 
um, Oregon, just east of Portland. Two people got the blame, so I can kill again. Cut buttons off jeans for proof. And it was signed with a smiley face. <laughs> so I think another, you can think of. <laughs> another graffiti in a bathroom turned up at a truck stop in East Oregon that said pretty much the same thing. Hmm. Laverne's attorney tried to get these two, you know, these admitted into the evidence, but um, the prosecutor and the judge figured it was just a friend of hers or John's trying to help them by making it seem like um, they had the wrong people. So basically it was ruled to be hearsay. Oh, boy. Yep. Her defense was that she had lied to try to frame John. She and John were bo- both found guilty. And the the recorded admission of her saying that she did it was pretty hard to come back from. Yeah. <laughs> um, John pleaded no contest to avoid a death penalty. And Le- Laverne got life with a minimum of 10 years. John got life with... Um, with 25 years mandatory. So put a put a knife in that. Oh, damn it. Yeah. That's like the most obvious knife point ever. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But four years later, the Oregonian newspaper got a letter. April 29th, 1994, it was a handwritten six-page letter. And at the top of it, there was a smiley face. The title was All Five of Five. <clears throat> it said, I would like to tell my story. I'm a good person at times. I've always wanted to be like. I've been married and divorced with children. I like your newspaper. I wanted to be noticed, but but I started something that I cannot stop. It then went into the details of Tanya's murder details that only the murderer would know but he called he he called her Sonia in this letter not Tanya other than that it matched up perfectly to what the police knew not the public right and the media but what the police knew about Tanya's murder he even talked about Laverne and John and confesses in detail um about an unsolved case in California. This woman's name was Claudia. He had kidnapped her, kept her for four days, and then dumped her body on Highway 95. Not I-95. Yeah. <laughs> the opposite other side, side of the country. country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he then confessed to yet another um, California murder, complete with details, including the body's location, saying that he had stomped on her throat to make sure that she was dead. Wow. Well. Okay. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. (laughs) Another murder. This one in Salem, Oregon's capital, near Portland. And and, and yet another one. There was five total. The The happy face was on every page of this letter. And we'll get to the details later. Uh, But he was taunting the police, telling them that he had convicted the wrong people. Well, that they, they had convicted the wrong people. The letter was examined, and the analysts thought that it was legit, and the analysts believed that they had locked up the wrong people. <laughs> stupid people. Well, yes, right. John, John's not stupid. John, John is actually a victim in this case, but Laverne, fucking idiot. Stupid. Yeah. The letter was tested for fingerprints and DNA, but there was no match because Keith had never been arrested before. But they had this profile now, so it was just a matter of time. Right. Um, the letter was published by the Oregonian, and they dubbed him the Happy Face Killer. It was huge nudes. Nudes. The, the, <laughs> huge nudes, yeah. Huge nudes, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, those old, old copper tone billboards back in the 70s and 80s, they... They could have been con- huge nudes. Uh, you know that was Jodie Foster, right? Are you serious? Yeah, the, that girl. That girl was Jodie Foster. The, With the, the dog pulling her, you, you see yeah. her butt crack. 
Yeah. That was Jodie Foster? Holy yeah. crap. I did, I did not know that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's, that's how, I mean, I remember it that way. So maybe it, maybe it isn't. I don't know. Okay. Confirm or did, or, or correct us in the, um, yeah. the comments. <laughs> I've heard it was Jodie what... Foster, so, but I, that could Actually, be one of those the... urban myths. I don't know. Yeah, now that you think about it, I, I, I not now that you say it, I think that it. Pro, I think that it was an urban legend. I think I remember hearing that on like an ur, urban legends TV, yeah. TV show on the History Channel, like after they were talking about like aliens and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> aliens, yeah. <laughs> but <clears throat> it was huge news because if because it meant that if this was for real. John and Laverne were innocent, and there was a freaking serial killer on the loose. Right. <laughs> but the, <coughs> that's what Keith wanted. He wanted the infamy. But authorities... Uh, uh, damn it. <laughs> authorities thought that they had the right people in prison for Tanya's murder, so they didn't want to reopen the case. This was uh, not a popular decision. Yeah. Yeah, of course not. More, more senseless officers in Portland? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I was going to go there, but I'm looking something up. <laughs> the situation was swept under the rug, and the authorities didn't even acknowledge the letter. The media did, though. But um, <clears throat> March 11, 1995, police got a phone call from somebody saying that they had found a body. You know, this this person was on Highway 14, which runs through the the gorge. Mm-hmm. Um, he had stopped to take a, a piss, and when he was doing that, he saw what he thought was a mannequin. <laughs> okay. It's never a mannequin. No. It's it's it it's never. There's never a shortcut. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> it's never fireworks. <laughs> um, oh, especially when you buy it for the never mind. But okay, so apparently real- she wasn't the girl, but she did do a commercial for Copper Tone. Oh, okay. Anyway, but he quickly realized that it was not a mannequin because it's never a mannequin. Never. She was she was nude. There were no clothes, no nothing, just her. So apparently she had been killed from somewhere else and then just dumped there. All right. She'd been strangled, her fingerprints were run, and it came back as Julie Whittingham. Um she was she she was just the next ones found. There were there are others before she was found between her and the the last one in his five of five letter. Um, she had been found on the Washington state side of the Columbia River, um, the Columbia River Gorge in um, Washougal? Washougal. It sounds Scottish. <laughs> but um, it's that's not about, Scottish, it's, it's crap. <laughs> <coughs> it's about 12, 12 miles east of Portland and Vancouver. But at the time, nobody thought that this woman was connected to Tanya Bennett's murder. Oh, why would yeah. they? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but um, she she was a sweet woman. She had a, a son named Don Fenley. Everybody liked her. Um, she began question. I mean, you know, you know, she 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 liked <laughs> truckers. We'll just say that she was a lot lizard. <laughs> I'm going to cut that out because it's yeah. a victim. But, um, you know what I mean. Yeah. But people began questioning people who knew her, and several people said that she had been spending time with a very large truck driver. Said truck driver had even co-signed a car loan with her. Uh-oh. So they went to the dealership, and they got the contract, that it was Keith Hunter Jesperson. Bum, bum. Bum. Police tracked down Keith's employer, a trucking company out of Spokane, Washington, 
and they confirmed that Keith was an employee of theirs, and at the time, he was driving a long load down uh, down the California coast and then over to Las Cruces, New Mexico. I've, I've, I've been to Las Cruces. Well, I, of course. <laughs> of course you uh, have. <laughs> <laughs> he was scheduled to be there two days later. So... Detectives hopped on a plane to Keith's destination, and they stopped him as soon as he went through the gate, and they said they wanted to ask him some questions. He was very friendly and cooperative. He told the deck... (laughs) He told the tape deck that... (laughs) No. um, he, He told the detectives so many times during their questioning that he was friendly and cooperative. Especially after they told him that they were from Washington and they were investigating Julie Whitting Julie Whittingham's murder, he talked about how nice of a guy he was. But he swore that he had no idea what happened to Julie. He admitted that they had known that he had known her for two years and that they had dated and Julie had ridden with him several times on long truck runs. He said that their relationship ended because she wanted more, but he didn't want to get married. But (laughs) several weeks before a murder, she and Keith had reconnected, and he just kind of went along with it. And He still wasn't into her, but she was willing to have sex with him, so he was all in. (laughs) Literally. Literally. (laughs) Um, Driving that load. (laughs) Uh, detectives thought that Keith was full of shit but they didn't have anything to arrest him for so they gave him a business card said you know give us a call if you remember anything else and with that the detectives went back to Washington March 24th 1995 when they got back Keith actually called him he said that he was going to turn himself in the next morning because he figured they were going to find out anyway. Okay. He actually did. He drove nonstop from New Mexico to Washington, which broke hours of service laws for those of you <laughs> that don't know how tr- trucking works. He could have been ticketed and shut down for that if he had gotten pulled over. <laughs> it's a t- it's a 23-hour drive from Las Cruces to um Washugo or whatever the hell the name of that. Yeah. And truckers are only allowed to drive 11 hours a day. So, yeah, he. Yeah. He booked it. Hammer down. Yep. He said on March 14th, Julie was going to ride with him. She had met him at his truck and even brought a pizza. Oh. Pizza. Who brings you pizza? She loves you. Yeah. <laughs> but um, they had sex and they talked. As they talked, Kate's like, "I want to go again." And she's like, "No, I'm, I'm, I'm good." And I'm good. he's he's like, "Well, what if I did it anyway?" She's like, "Well, that would be rape," and she would report it. So Keith flipped out and strangled her. And he drove up Highway 14. He dumped her down an embankment. And then he was arrested and charged with Julie's murder. All right. Police were looking at this at this as an open and shut case until Keith's younger brother Brad contacted them, saying that they needed to check out a letter that Keith had written them that he had received on March twenty fourth, nineteen ninety five. He okay. confessed to being uh, Keith confessed to being a killer for five years, and he apologized for turning out this way. He had expected the death sentence, and he admitted to killing eight women and ass- assaulted even more. But before he turned himself in, he called Brad and told him to destroy the letter. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um. Brad obviously didn't, although he did tell Keith that he had destroyed the letter. (laughs) So right now... Fuck you, middle kid. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
Right now, police knew of six. You know, the original five from his first letter and Julie Whittingham. Mm -hmm. But Keith didn't go into detail in this murder. So how would they find the remaining two? He was, of course, a long-haul truck driver. Uh... (laughs) That's how they did We're not dealing with senseless officers here. (laughs) Apparently not. They sent a teletype that went out to all other law enforcement agencies. This is like the precursor to email. (laughs) They were saying that they had a long haul trucker confessing to being a serial killer and his MO was strangulation and he was known to dump victims on the side of the road. Once, but once he started talking, they decided to go back to Tanya Bennett's murder because, after all, he had confessed to that in person in that letter. Mm-hmm. So he began spilling details. Tanya had hugged him out of the blue, like I mentioned earlier. And, you know, I I, I actually had an encounter with a, a girl like this in, in South Carolina. She was mentally challenged and just walking up to everybody, giving hugs and stuff. Mm-hmm. It, I was at a Bilo, which is a grocery store chain, and you know, <laughs> chain in the in the Carolinas, a pretty shitty one. But no, I mean, not everybody can have Publix. <laughs> 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 Sponsor <Yeah>. us, Publix. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna but, say, um, dude, I shop at Walmart, man. <laughs> you no, know, it's close to my house. It is, and it's less expensive than. Publix. And they and they deliver, so. <laughs> well, everybody delivers. If you've got Instacart. Well, now, but yeah, no. I mean, actually, Walmart has a delivery. It's not Instacart. No. Oh. So yeah. Does does it cost? Does it cost extra? Um, I don't think so. I think we. I mean, we paid like a membership to sign up for it. So, yeah, but not per I'm delivery. Gonna, I'm gonna look into that. I'm gonna look into that. Because, um, yeah, dude, it's fucking great. Ray makes order. It shows up at the house. We go out and help him bring it in. Done deal. Hell yeah, I'm going to look into that. If I want fried chicken, I'll just go to Publix and get it. Or Winn-Dixie, yeah. because Winn-Dixie's fried chicken is pretty damn good, too. Publix fried chicken <laughs> and fucking sweet tea. from Publix sweet tea and Publix fried chicken is the best shit in the world. And the pub sub. Yeah, the pub sub's good, too. <laughs> so um yeah but this this girl had just you know we were in this bilo and um uh, you know it was, it was i was you know just shopping there with um my ex-wife and we were um just doing our thing and this girl comes up and she's probably like late teens early 20s and she looked yeah, you know, she she was pretty. She wasn't like dressed slutty or anything, but she was a pretty girl. And she just walked up to us. She's like, "Hi," and I don't I don't think that she was drunk either. She's just like, and she runs up to me and like basically jumps on me. And she's like, "I want a hug." Okay. And and then she's like, "Thank you," and then runs off. I'm looking at my ex-wife. I'm like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> right? What the hell was that? It was weird. I didn't see her again the rest of the time that we were in the store. It, it was just weird. It was like a, it was like a drive-by hugging. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Anyway, but, but anyway. still, I mean, but I, I, I think that Tanya probably had a little more... <sighs> control of her facilities than this girl did uh, yeah. but whatever it's just as i was going through the the research on this and everything i came across that and i was just like yeah i've kind of experienced something like that yeah, it happens <laughs> yeah i mean she wasn't mean she wasn't rude she wasn't sexual she wasn't anything she just wanted to give me a hug like okay she just wanted to invade <laughs> your personal space well no she gave me a hug and it wasn't even you know whatever I mean, she didn't do anything because if she had, no, my know. ex-wife would have probably whooped her ass. But <laughs> that no, no, man. Nah, she probably wouldn't have. But every time, like you know, she, you're saying that she went in and hugged everybody at the bar. Every time, anytime that happens to me, 
It's like they sit right next to me <laughs> and just like talk. Well, I was at a grocery store constantly, but... and I'm like, I want to be left alone. Yeah, leave leave me alone. Why me? <laughs> There's ten other dudes at this bar. Why me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. So Keith said that he left and came back, but Tanya was still there, and he started talking with her, and they started talking about going to eat at a restaurant, probably like a Waffle House or something like that, because it was later in the day. But, um, you know, she was up for it. Now, remember, this is his side of the story. Uh-huh. Remember, earlier we were talking about she, he hadn't been there. You know, the, the witnesses said that he hadn't been there very long. And, you know, she left, or she hadn't been there very long, and she left, like, around the same time that those two dudes that she was the playing pool with. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he had to run home and get some money and everything. He, had to, he was in the bar, but his... He kind of backs us up in his little, you know, in his recorded confession. He's just like, I just had a little bit of money to go to the bar with. I had to go back home and get more money. But Do they whatever. had ATMs? But, um, <laughs> Weren't there ATMs then? I don't even know. 95? Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> no. No, this was 90, so maybe not. I I can't remember. I don't know. But they went back to the home, you know, to his house and they but they never made it to dinner because they got frisky. They got busy. <sighs> this is the craziest thing. This is clearly a psychopath admitting something that no man on the face of the planet has ever admitted to in in an effort to make it oh, okay nobody would ever lie about that so it's got to be true right so uh, she pissed him off complaining that there hadn't been enough foreplay and she just wanted him to go ahead and get it over with just get it over. are you done yet why would you admit to that? You're you're already in there. Why would you admit to that? You know? You're not doing yourself any favors. Right? <laughs> well, I see some. If anything If anything, if if you somehow manage to beat this and get released, you're gonna have a new nickname in addition to <laughs> Igor and Baby Huey. You're you're gonna have um quick draw McGraw quick quick draw withdraw. <laughs> oh god I didn't even have that written I just came up with it <laughs> right on but that pissed Keith off and he pummeled his face with her fist like brutally And he pummeled he his finished. face with her fist That's, did I say that? yeah he pummeled her face with his fists. There you go. And then, and then he finished her off by strangling her with the <laughs> rope. And he, he left her body in the house for an entire day. And he was living in this house with an with another woman, who was also a truck driver, but she was out on you know she was out of town. Oh, she, okay, she wasn't there. All right. Right. So he said that he he cut the zipper out of her jeans because um, he was worried that his fingerprints might be on the the zipper or the buttons actually it was, it was a it was a button fly not a zipper fly okay because this was 1990 <laughs> the button flies were um, the thing back then man i don't know why i've 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 owned one pair and only one pair i was just like this fucking sucks <laughs> well you know, you'll get your junk caught in the zipper you know <laughs> this is true but that's only happened to me twice in my life Twice, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it didn't hurt it up the first time, so you had to do it again. Well, it was, it was an accident both times. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, oh man, 
He then loaded her up and took her body to the Columbia River Gorge and dumped her, you know, and dumped her off. He then, he then took them to the police to the location where he had ditched her purse. Five years later, it was still there, and Tanya's ID was in it. Wow. Yeah, so he's proving it to them. Yeah. Police had him write some things. Yeah, and this 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 writing was compared to the um the writing that was in the letter to Brad, his brother, as well as the first letter to the Oregonian, and it was a match. They also compared the DNA they had taken off of you know, the first letter to um to Keith, and it was also a match. Um all of his confessions were identical to the details of his first letter. And when things quieted down, he would contact the media for interviews. He was, like, really enjoying the spotlight. Um, he confessed to eight murders in Washington, Oregon, California, Florida, and Wyoming. Why is Florida always involved in this crazy shit? <laughs> he's a, he's a long-haul truck driver. And Florida's a place where crazy shit happens, so, yeah. Well, he's a long haul truck driver. He's been all over the country, just well, like yeah, I have. Yeah, but you know, he did, he could have <laughs> he could have not killed somebody in Florida and left Florida out of a story for once. In a TV interview, he was asked if he was the happy face killer. He replied, "I am the happy face killer." <laughs> well, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> the the um, reporter asked why he did it, and he said, "I don't know." I was bored. But, Seemed like the thing to yeah. do at the time. Yeah. He said that he had decided to come clean to get Laverne and John out of prison because they were serving time for his crime. Yeah, but he didn't care about them. He just wanted the spotlight. Right. You know? Oh, yeah. Either way, John and Laverne were acquitted and released, and this whole thing was La- Laverne trying to set John up so she- and and she got so caught up that she lost herself in the process. I mean, she had really studied this case, and everything that she said had been released in the news. But I don't know. She she managed to dig deep and be convincing enough to where, even though it was just stuff that had been released in the news, they um. And this was before they, the internet, really. Yeah. Well, it's at the virgining. Yeah. Well, this is ninety five. No, yeah, that is before the internet. Yeah, a little bit. I mean. It, it was there in its infancy. Yeah. but um, There was no Google then. You couldn't check shit out. <laughs> no. <laughs> Back then it was freaking dial up. It took you yeah, right. 20, 20 mm-hmm. minutes just to download one freaking page. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, that, that horrible sound, too. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the dial up tone was just, oh, my God. Yeah. Anyway. But it was a really long process to, you know, to reverse the conviction. Mm-hmm. But I personally think that Laverne should be in prison for derailing the investigation into Tanya's fucking murder with her false stories. Because yeah. Tanya, was Keith, Tanya was Keith's first murder. And if she hadn't done that, seven other women might not have been killed. That's very true. Yeah, she definitely needs to be... Uh... Well, she was fifty-seven in um, in nineteen in nineteen ninety. So I'm pretty sure that she's not with us anymore. But uh, yeah. But um, yeah. John was beating her. Fine. Call the police on him for that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try to frame him for something that he didn't do. Was oh, John shit. a piece of shit? Maybe. Who knows? I'm I'm gonna say maybe because not he was never convicted of being abusive to her. That was just her story, right? But yeah, she yeah the at yeah, most yeah, false falsifying evidence, false false accusation. What do they call that? Um, whatever you know. I mean, yeah, yeah, dude. I mean, well, I don't know how long she was in for before they figured it out. Cert- Five years. That was it. Well, 
Probably she probably wouldn't get much more than that anyway. I don't know. Because there's seven women there's seven women that were killed after Tanya Bennett, but there's but he confessed to a lot more. So and some of, I'm I'm pretty sure that some of the things that he confessed to that were never proven actually happened. You know? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say there's probably 15 women that, you know, if, if, you know, if, if, if they had just, if she had just stayed out of it and let them focus on the facts, they would have found them yeah, right. a lot sooner, you know? Uh-huh. But yeah, right. I, I don't, I, I hate this woman. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's, she, she's got blood on, she's got blood on her hands. Yeah. Keith was convicted of multiple life sentences with no parole, and he's in Oregon State Penitentiary. Five of Keith's victims were identified initially. Tanya Bennett, 23 years old, in Portland, Portland, Oregon. She was bludgeoned and strangled, as we covered. Yeah, he Cynthia beat his face Wil- with her fists. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia Wilk. <laughs> Cynthia Wilcox, 32 years old, strangled in Sherlock, California, August 27th, 1992. Claudia, a Jane Doe, 21 to 26 years old, she was raped and strangled in Mount Shasta, California. Lori Pentland, 26 years old, strangled April 8th, 1992 in Salem, Oregon. Angela... Surprise, 21 years old, raped and strangled in Spokane, Washington. When he was done with her, he tied the corpse face down to the bottom of his trailer so that it was touching the road and then dragged her for miles until she just literally fell off when there was nothing left. Jesus. I'm glad that she was already dead when he did that. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Jeez. Julie Whittingham. 41 years old, strangled in Washington, with, uh, Washington, as we covered. Keith confessed to three others, Claudia in California, um, one other in California, and one in Crestview, Florida. Um, Patricia Skipple. She was 45 years old, killed in Santa Anella, California. But it's unclear exactly how she died. She was a Dane Joe. A da- God damn, I've got freaking dyslexia tonight. <laughs> oh, shit. A Dane Joe. <laughs> Dane Joe. That's a t shirt. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that's, that's the best t shirt idea yet. <laughs> Dane Joe. Uh, <laughs> oh comment comment if you want that t-shirt <laughs> if we get enough i'll make it happen <laughs> first five get a free one <laughs> but there has to be more than five <laughs> okay <laughs> but she was a jane doe and she was linked by dna and then um, Suzanne <sighs> Gellingbird, K J E L L E M B U R G, Gellingbird. Uh, it's, it's it's probably like Yellingbird or something like that. Yellingbird, like probably like that. Sca- I mean, like Scandinavian or something. Yeah, like the, the but, K and the J make a Y sound, I guess, hmm. or something like that. She was 34 years old and strangled in Crestview, Florida, on September night, you know, September 14th, 1994. November 2008, Melissa, Keith's daughter, went on a talk show tour promoting her book. Um, the book was called Shattered Silence, The Untold Story of a Serial Killer's Daughter. Um, she joins BTK's daughter, Carrie, as children of serial killers who are speaking out against their sick ass fathers all right but but she went on oprah in 2020 and that piece of shit dr phil um <laughs> fuck and, you dr phil yeah fuck you dr phil 
Dr. Phil is... Anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, to, to, to talk about it and everything. And, yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order the book. I'm going to... Um, yeah, I didn't know about it until I started reading this. Yeah, you know, right. like putting together this episode, but I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get the book. I'm gonna add it to my little growing library that I have here. <laughs> and, um, but that's it. Freaking Keith Jesperson, the Happy Face Killer. The Happy Face Killer. Wow, that's crazy. That yeah, that, I didn't never never expected that one lady, that whatever her name was, that like <laughs> La- Laverne. Yeah, Laverne. Yeah. I don't know how I forgot that name. But is she, because uh, that's something you don't. That hardly ever happens. Nobody fucking actually takes the blame for it. <laughs> oh, I know, but she probably thought that just like it would be like pinned on him because like like he made her do it. Yeah. Or whatever, but she didn't have to do it. No. If, if, even if it happened exactly the way that she said it, she didn't have to do she it. She didn't have to, no. No, she didn't, dude. That's fucked up. Anyway. Yeah, but... But it's like they're just standing there arguing when they... You know, when she gets the jubits. I guess he had already raped her at that point. That's one thing that she left out. Yeah. It's just like, okay, they were standing there, but... You know, Tanya Bennett's body, you know, T- Tanya Bennett had been raped. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, anyway. yeah, this this woman was just a freaking idiot. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, <it's> messed up. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, I hate to, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, just, no, she put herself into the story. Yeah. And. Got so wrapped up in it that she hampered an investigation. Well, that too, but she's just like. Anyway, maybe maybe if I admit to being complicit, they'll um, they'll take me seriously, and right. um, and then you know, I but I'll you. get off because it was yeah, him. Because it was him, yeah, yeah, right? But fucking idiot. <sighs> Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Thanks a hell of a lot for listening. We appreciate the hell out of it. Please yeah. be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment wherever you can. Wow, that went pretty smoothly. Yeah. Let's see what I can do with the rest of it. <laughs> and comment if I you haven't... wanted to comment. Dane Joe, if you want a T-shirt, and I'll get it done. <laughs> Dane make, Joe. If we get en- if we get enough people that want them, I'll make it happen. <laughs> Dane Joe. <laughs> I will. I'll make it happen. That 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 that's that. That just took the the top seed for oh, yeah. the the best billism that there's ever been. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> that's even better than rapeled. Rapeled. <laughs> And Rapel was a good one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, com- comment. You you can comment on um, Apple, and you can now comment on Spotify. So make sure you hit us up there, rate and review. Um, not to mention YouTube, yes. where you can watch video of us two jackasses um, <laughs> you know, doing this. Yeah, right. you, can com- you, you can obviously comment on that. Everybody knows that. Yes, you too. <laughs> <laughs> click so. like, click subscribe, click the little dingy bell thingy so you know when a new one's coming out. Comment, comment away. Yes, absolutely. Um, and until next time, later. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.